Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're joining us from around the world. Welcome to Web3 Warriors, episode 97, featuring Jeff Zavala, aka Z Creative, the immersive storyteller and artist and creator of the Coralverse, which is a really cool use of the metaverse to really raise awareness and advocacy around the health of the coral reef. Welcome, Jeff. How are you doing today? Amazing. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Oh, I'm excited to have you. You know, we've definitely talked on um, some sustainable sustainability projects before, but specifically looking at kind of how you're trying to raise awareness around ocean conservation and really doing it in a fun way, trying to gamify it, bringing in the metaverse while also using the blockchain and NFTs. It's just fascinating. So I'm really grateful for you to join us and uh, looking forward to really having a good conversation that our listeners will get a lot of value out of and see another interesting use case for the blockchain and the metaverse. So really grateful to have you here. And uh, welcome everyone, I'm David Chroma, I'm your host. I go by Chrome in the Metaverse. And as I mentioned today on Web3 Warriors, we're gonna be looking at the conversation of sustainability and specifically ocean conservation uh, when it comes to tracking the health of the coral reef, tracking the health of other ocean life really, and how we can potentially use the metaverse and the blockchain to bring new awareness, but also raise revenue, raise funds, and really make a difference in the world, which again is what Web3 Warriors is always about, looking at the power of the technology, looking at the creator economy that's happening in Web3 for the sake of creativity, but also advocacy. And I think we've seen that in a lot of different spaces, whether it's social advocacy, environmental advocacy, or just advocating for creators and artists to get their fair share, right? That's really what the Web3 space is about. It's what blockchain presents, and it's also what the metaverse is presenting presenting as it embraces kind of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology to really reward creators more in the future. So looking at this kind of space of sustainability, there's three kind of core use cases that I think we've hit on a little bit in the past um, on Web3 Warriors, and I'm just going to recap them here, and then we'll dive into some questions for Z here. Um, so looking at it, there is the most obvious kind of use case, I think, is being able to kind of improve the tracking of data on chain. So um, this could mean making reports and having kind of really key data points being very accessible and transparent to everybody on a public blockchain. So where we've seen that in one case, of course, is in the clothing space um, and the supply chain and being able to actually see, you know, from the seed, from the materials, all the way through the production, you know, who's doing what and who's getting paid what and is the sourcing system sustainable environmentally, socially. So that's been really interesting. And now, you know, with something like the Coralverse, we can see data around the actual health of the coral reef being traced more publicly and more accountably on the blockchain where you actually see it in real time, you know, what's happening or even the sea levels or any of these kind of environmental issues that we're, we're dealing with, you know? Um, so that's one piece, just tracking data in a very kind of accountable, transparent way, right? Uh, another point that we've definitely touched on before is gamifying things, you know, and this is where I really think the Coralverse is taking things in a really cool uh, direction. So with the metaverse, allowing for 3D immersive experiences, but also being able to tie in, you know, NFTs and purchasing NFTs on the blockchain, which then have future utility um, for a project. We've seen like the ability to actually uh, gamify the immersive experiences and make the learning a little bit more fun and, you know, more sticky really, right? Because ultimately talking about the health of the coral reef, often gets ignored, is often seen as kind of a nerdy conversation, but if you can have fun with it and you can make it more engaging, especially to the youth and the young people coming up, I think that might help uh, with the overall kind of narrative around these kind of issues, right? Um, and then lastly, very importantly, creating kind of a new avenue to raise funds and awareness around kind of a cause that you really want to uh, put a highlight on, right? So we've seen this with Shark Tales is one of the first kind of sustainability projects that we've talked to. Uh, shout out to Raven and Andre Mirapolsky, uh, who have a really cool project around kind of actually tagging sharks and understanding, you know, the health of the shark ecosystem. And you can actually adopt a shark through an NFT. So that's just another example of kind of 
being able to advocate for something that maybe isn't getting a lot of uh, press while also tying in your art, also tying in maybe your video game or your uh, immersive experience online, but importantly, raising funds for this issue while also raising awareness and collaboration and kind of building a community because every single person that purchases something to support your initiative, you now have their wallet address. You can now engage with that and use that data for uh, other reasons for the project. So those are kind of three big issues or big kind of um, powerful innovations that blockchain presents to sustainability advocacy. So with that, maybe we'll jump into the interview with Z. Welcome again, Z. Um, before we dive into the Coralverse, I definitely want to get a little bit of background on yourself because I know you have quite an impressive kind of resume of NFTs and interesting creative uh, projects that you've worked on in the space. So um, what is kind of your background as a creator and what really brought you to kind of Web3 in the blockchain? Yeah, well, thank you so much. Well, so I actually started going to like all these blockchain conferences in uh, 2017, 2018 during South by Southwest, because I'm here, I'm located in Austin, Texas. And so it's just right in my backyard. So I thought might as well take advantage of all this knowledge being put out there, all this alpha. And that's when I realized this technology is really revolutionary. It's game changing. And I wanted people, average people to be able to take advantage of that and not just see this technology end up being like only in the hands of the, in the, of the elite, right? So that's when I leaned on my background as a storyteller uh, from citizen journalism that I was doing and wanted to branch into something less documentary and more narrative. So my first narrative film that I ever created uh, took four years to create. And it was right after 2018, going to all these conferences and figuring out how do I tell the story of Web3 and these technologies so that it can be consumable for the average person. And that's what this film was about. So it's called Beyond Here. And it was my first uh, NFT Genesis collection. Uh, I minted it using um, Rarible. And, you know, that's kind of around the time we met, David, like nice. back in the day on Clubhouse. <laughs> Good and that, times. And that was one that had like some kind of social angle, if I remember correctly, a bill of rights yes. and this kind of like very kind of pro-democracy, uh, pro-freedom kind of angle. Can you speak yeah. to that a little bit and maybe the inspirations there and how you think blockchain might be rising to the occasion to help people uh, maybe establish their rights, more sovereignty? Most definitely. Yeah, it's such a prescient thing right now. Like even Biden is talking about the, uh, you know, Bill of Rights for the digital era, right? And AI. And that's, that's a really big topic right we now. We can't so. ignore it, right? It's like, <laughs> we got to at least try. I think some people would say it's in yeah. vain, but we, we got to do something. <laughs> it's true. Like, we need to at least start the conversation and get people thinking about these things, you know, so I'm, I'm glad to be on the podcast, so we can discuss it. But um yeah, one of the things for me was just seeing like the massive impact that um, let, let's say like social media has had. So if you're aware of different films like The Social Dilemma or The Great Hack, like these films really inspired me to continue with this project that took four years, the Beyond Here film, because uh, I started it before I saw those um, documentaries. But then when I saw the documentaries, I thought, man, I'm really on the right track. I'm thinking in the right way because there are already these films coming out talking about it. 100%. So for me, it was like, when you actually sit down and see the effects of social media, you know, you have um, people from like a young age growing up with this and there are a lot of, you know, detrimental things that can happen mental health wise. So th there has been studies to link a rise in depression you know, between certain age groups. And for me, I thought, what if we could tell the story of how social media is sort of shaping our minds um, and how we can use blockchain to own our own data and sort of transcend, transcend the Web2 paradigm, right? So that's this film beyond here uses a lot of visual metaphors. There's no um, speaking in it, but it just uses a lot of beautiful imagery to sort of visually convey these ideas of like the walled gardens or your crypto keys, right? right? Self-sovereignty, all these concepts. So this idea of the digital bill of rights, right? Amazing, and amazing. Uh, you need to create these conversations. And yeah, I encourage people to go check out that, that story uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. 
So Beyond Here is on Rarible. I'm going to find the link for that, and we'll include it in our uh, description for the for the podcast and in uh, the information below the YouTube. Uh, but I was able to bring up your Freedom Flowers, which I think are related, oh, yeah. right? Um, and they seem to Absolutely. speak. They seem to speak to the right to anonymity, the right to privacy, and these important issues around kind of digital sovereignty, digital liberties. And what we've been talking about on the show is the idea that Web three can actually bring in data sovereignty. And I feel like that's the conversation that really a lot of these big brands, the Twitters, the, the metas of the world just don't want to have, you know, and that's, I think we see a lot of people kind of pushing to like, start talking about web four or web five already, because the web three, the real crux of web three is taking the ownership of everything online into your own sovereign, uh, like wallet, you know, and being able to actually see what's happening on chain. So your sovereign, your data becomes more sovereign, or at least you know what's happening with it. And I feel Feel like the Twitters and all the social medias of Web2 really don't want us to realize what's possible and advocate for those rights because their whole game is over when that happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Yeah. And um, one of the things about the Freedom Flowers is that I wanted to have a collection that everybody could part uh, participate in. Uh, so that is actually a uh, an additions. So the Freedom Flowers, there's like one of them that has, there's like 100 copies Another one has like 10 copies and everywhere in between. But the Beyond Here film is, are, those are like one of ones. So a little bit more rare, more expensive. But the Freedom Flowers actually are a way to engage these concepts of these digital liberties that we, we really do need like a virtual constitutional convention, so to speak, <laughs> to start laying these things out, you know, and codifying them into law. So how, how do we do that before before we dive into the choral verse? You know, I like to get political. <laughs> how, how are we going to how are we yeah. going to like make that a reality? Because I really feel like a lot of people are on the same wave. I think most Web3 natives know that like we're here for the digital sovereignty. We're here for financial sovereignty, financial education. Um, and somehow the politics has to catch up. And right now, I think there's very, very few politicians who truly accept and acknowledge or even promote the value of blockchain and web three. So uh, how, how right. are you feeling about that evolution right now? I mean, actually I'm very encouraged with what's happening. Um, even just on the political level in the state house and people who are advocating, like the great thing about America is like, you can run for office. Like if you don't see someone that's representing your interests and you have these ideas of digital liberties, run, you know, there run you for council or whatever, just be part of that conversation, be part of the politics that makes the real change happen. So yeah, uh, the first step is just identifying the problem. You know, a lot of good documentaries are out about the problem. So education first, and then advocacy, you know, like creating a platform um, to really discuss these things. How do we start creating these, put it, in, put it as part of the law, you know, that's, those are the next steps. No doubt. I love it. That's a very true, you know, statement. In the end, if you don't like what you see, then step up and get involved. You know, <laughs> that's what it takes. Yeah, even what we're doing, having the conversation, what you're doing with your projects and what, of course, many other advocates and people working in the space and pushing the technology forward. We're all doing our small part. Right. So can't ask for too much yes. more. But I agree on the politicians front. It would be nice to see some politicians out there with the, the same viewpoint that we have really speaking forcefully about the innovation and the positive disruption that can be done here uh, in web three awesome uh, yeah. with that we will turn it to the choral verse because i am very curious and i want to make sure we got lots of time to kind of dive into what you're working on i know it's still you know in the evolution process you've got different pieces rolling out so tell us a little bit about the choral verse and kind of the mission and vision behind it yeah sure absolutely so this started from mona mona verse uh, my friends told me about this concept of being able to build an entire three-dimensional immersive world that you can own on chain as your own space and to be able to customize that as as the platform evolves so i uh you know had this background of graphic design photography filmmaking and then i looked at the next medium on the horizon which is that 3d immersive world in the metaverse and i always had to um you know take that step into the next medium. And this is uh, using the Unity game engine. So I had to learn that. And, you know, Mona has a lot of, a lot of great tutorials for that. So it's been a long journey um, since, you know, the beginning of the Coralverse, the conception started as a grants project 
So I applied for the Mona Grants Project and they, you know, they had funding to help me put aside things so that I could focus solely on this. And nice. yeah, it's it's been an insane journey, but the idea behind the Coralverse is that originally we wanted to inspire architects and other builders in the 3D world to create environments around ocean conservation and to tell that story. So we created the Coralverse Estates, which are AI generated um, you know, houses essentially that live on the Ethereum blockchain. And they are underwater houses that have a, a bunch of different styles of architecture. Because the other idea is you go into a single space and it's a gallery and you can go around and see and learn all the different styles of architecture throughout history, or at least the first 25. We stuck with 25 different styles of architecture. Dang. So the Genesis collection is all there. There's 25 different styles. You can go, anyone can go into the, on a web browser, go into the Coralverse community hub. And yeah, you can learn about all these styles of architecture, be inspired to build your own spaces. And these are all collectibles. So let's say you collect the cyberpunk style of architecture. So that Coralverse estate, um, and right now it's just a 2D blueprint, but by owning that blueprint, you can, um, you have access to a builder that like either I'll connect you with, or you can bring your own builder. But the idea is we would turn that blueprint into an actual 3D space um, and like sort of customize that space for you based on like what you're wanting to use it for and everything. And so once you so, buy one of these buildings in whichever architecture, I didn't know there were 25 even <laughs> different ones, but I know a few. I, I love architecture. That's the thing. But 25 is a lot of variation. Um, so you can purchase the actual building, which is not yet a 3D digital asset. It's 2D blueprints, essentially. Yes. And the goal would be to then you, you with your team will be able to create this building within the Coralverse, which is a large 3D world. I'm looking at a little bit of your video um, and I'm loading it up right now, but a little bit of the video you had on Twitter, just showing a little snippets of the world. So within this world, what you're envisioning is a bunch of different buildings with people that want to support the project, basically having a kind of digital home in there. You can show your NFTs. You can just be part of the community. Obviously you're supporting the Coral initiative, right? Um, so is that the kind of the vision that it basically builds out as a kind of digital village type of thing? Yeah, exactly. So our, the community hub, there's port, There's a ring of portals and each blueprint is, has its own portal. And so imagine being able to go into this space where all 25 Genesis estates are all linked together in one place. So I can get to anywhere in the Coralverse from this one community hub. That was the first space that we built. And then nice. by owning one of those spaces, um, and what we can do is we'll build a 3D world for you based on that blueprint and based on your customization of the things you want to do. And then what's cool is like, we can now gamify it. We're now looking into gamification because Mona is coming out with some really useful tools to make it a lot easier to create games. And the idea is like, we're going to be gamifying this in a way where you earn NFTs as achievements. And then those NFTs unlock real world funding for the uh, conservation effort of regrowing coral in the actual ocean. So epic, epic. I'm looking through a little yeah. bit of the NFTs here. I'm liking the deco one, you know, I'm a fan of the more gaudy kind of style. <laughs> so yeah. I'm seeing um, a little bit of uh, integration of AI, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, how are you kind of yeah. leaning on the tool of uh, artificial intelligence to assist with building out this vision? Yeah, well, so the cool thing is that we're going to be able to create non-player characters or uh, you know, NPCs. Yes. And we'll be able to go and interact. Like, we'll have an AI sort of agent that you can interact with in the Coralverse and various uh, phases. So like right now we have the jellyfish pagoda is, is one of the spaces. Okay. It's like a Japanese style architecture. And that has actually already been constructed into a 3d space. So the idea that these blueprints are just 2d JPEGs, it's true for all of them, except for one. And that <laughs> that's the one that's already a 3d space. So now we're going to be, uh, gamifying that 3d space. So 
imagine being able to walk up to like a bear or some kind of creature in this, um, <laughs> you know, jellyfish pagoda space. And then you start seeing actions happen. You see weird things happening with that bear and like you're interacting with it. So you're going to be able to like have conversations with different characters in the space. And it's going to like trigger you to go down a quest. But one of the main objectives, one of the main gameplay actions is going to be trash cleanup. It doesn't sound like a fun thing, <laughs> but yeah, make imagine it fun. going around collecting coins or gems or something, right. but it's, in this case, it's just trash. And when you see but something you like that, encourage... do you envision it as some element of play to earn and not necessarily yeah. earn like real money, but earn NFT, earn collectives that have use within the coral verse at the very least, if not real right. world value? Is that kind of an angle you're taking? Yeah, because, you know, in the traditional gaming world, you work so hard to get, get all these achievements and then it's sort of trapped in that ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. But with Web3 gaming, you own your assets. So we want people to feel a sense of accomplishment when they clean up the digital oceans and make it more vibrant, life lifelike place with all the marine life swimming around after, you know, cleaning up all the trash. You earn an achievement for that. You know, we want to reward people and create the right incentives. So, you, you know, it may be something as small as like an NFT that represents your achievement, but the idea is we're going to be able to link those achievements to our partners like the Thousand Mermaids Project or the Ocean Rescue Alliance nice. or Coral Gardeners. And so what we'll do is make it so that their gameplay, they're playing to learn, but also to earn and to make real world impact. So those NFTs are gonna act as sort of like a discount code for like a hundred percent off. And they, they'll be able to go and check out at these different nonprofits that are doing Ocean Rescue Alliance or doing the ocean conservation. And then you'll be able to like sort of claim your physical sculpture to be planted in the real ocean along with some coral cells to help repopulate and grow the coral reef so your nft achievement in the digital world is linked to a physical project that's actually growing real life coral that's awesome and, uh, and so if i'm hearing this correctly the the project was already kind of a web 2 traditional initiative that was happening and you're kind of tying into it from a web three perspective from the metaverse from the coral verse and what was the response to those partners i guess like were they yeah. How did that come about? Did, was there any kind of like um, difficulty kind of convincing them that it was worth partnering with you or did you already kind of have these connections? How, how did that come about? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So actually, I credit my friend Hazel Griffith. Hmm. Uh, so she connected me with Shelby, who runs uh, the Ocean Rescue Alliance and the Thousand Mermaids Project. Hmm. And they had already been doing 3D scans of their mermaid sculptures and they had a LIDAR scan and Hazel and I sort of cleaned that up. She painted it and that's in the Coral Verse Community Hub right now. Nice. And so that artifact, anybody can click on there and it'll link to their website so you can learn more about what they're doing. But they're sort of already of this mindset of like, how do we use Web3 technologies and immersive experiences to really push for ocean conservation? And now we're just working out like all the technical details of of how do we build, how do we do the gamification, first of all, but then how do we link those assets that you earn in the game mm -hmm. to their marketplace, which could just be a plugin, you know, like I just, I need to do a little more research, but I'm finding the right people to help on that journey. No doubt. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm thinking about it and yeah, I can just see where there's a lot of like potential costs, but when you're already kind of an entity that's doing that, and it's just a matter of kind of sinking in with what they're already doing, it's less of like a heavy lift. And, you know, yeah, there's got to be some kind of low hanging fruit. And at the very least, even just raising the education, raising the awareness level is obviously a lot. It's it's something into a, in and of itself, I would say. But uh, we'll, we'll see. It sounds really amazing, man. And um, when it comes to kind of the actual like real impact that's happening on the ground right now like just in general like what what is the 
actual emergency with the coral reef right now um if i can yeah. show my ignorance a bit i know that there is sure. obviously issues around um the temperatures going up and apparently impacting sea life and i've seen that the trash and the pollution essentially that we're throwing into the oceans is having a pretty bad problem uh but if you yeah. could maybe highlight it a little bit more i'm guessing in all your work and research you've probably got some good stats so what is the what's the emergency and how can we all kind of do our part to to help the coral reef Right, yeah. Well, so, you know, off the coast of Florida, uh, there was actually a recent incident where during the summertime, the ocean, yeah, the temperatures were really rising and there was nearly like 90% of loss of species of all the coral. And so now one of the solutions to that is uh, more like heat, resi heat, heat resistant species. So they're looking for various species of coral that can sort of withstand some of these higher temperatures and then making an effort to sort of repopulate the reefs on that end. Mm. Um, but then, yeah, like the reason the gameplay includes trash cleanup is like, that's a real world problem. And we also want to be able to contribute to that effort financially for these nonprofits to do that real world work. But it also starts with like a culture. So I think like with the gameplay, like kids are learning how important it is to like keep it clean, you know, and, yeah. <laughs> and just raising these issues. So yeah, well, if, if you've seen any of those videos with all the plastic, it's horrible. Oh, it's brutal. Yeah. And kudos to those who are creating innovative solutions. I've seen like that one, I can't remember the name of the company now, but they've created those automated boats that go along the river and like how much trash they're picking up is just insane. And they put them into wow. like developing uh, countries, especially where they've got like entire rivers just clogged with pollution. And they're able to put this like, I don't even know what it is type of submarine that just automatically like picks up all the trash and it's insane how clean they're able to get a river after like a week or two of just using that thing on it. So there are people oh, actually wow. trying to do the hard work of cleaning up the trash that's already there. But importantly, those of us um, who are throwing away our trash need to be a little more uh, understanding and uh, trying to, you know, have a smaller footprint maybe where we can. So um, I did just jump yeah. into the ocean and found this amazing underwater uh, coral verse experience here in the, I guess this would be the community hub. And there's a cool like angel yes. statue under here as well. Um, and I was thinking another thing that this shows people, obviously it's not the actual ocean, but it is real ocean life. And it does obviously use actual imagery of the coral reef. And it just shows you how beautiful it is, right? And a lot of people like, people up here in Canada where I'm at, we don't get to see the ocean, most of us, except if you're on the West Coast or East Coast. Um, so we don't actually know much about like the beautiful kind of ecosystem that's being threatened and kind of destroyed. Um, so having the opportunity to actually run around in the ocean and, and see the space and see the wildlife, I think maybe will help people just kind of understand like we're really threatening a lot of life and a lot of beauty in the earth that we maybe don't otherwise acknowledge. So <laughs> there's that so side true. of it as well. Yeah. Um, I did want yeah, to get your thoughts. Sorry. Uh, I was saying like, that was one of the big inspirations for me of why I wanted to start this. Uh, when I look at the ocean and there's the wondrous myriad of creatures and it's just so wonderful. You know, we know so little about that and, you know, we're going to destroy it before we can have a chance to even learn and see like, you know, maybe there's like the cure for cancer down there. Who knows? <laughs> Honestly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of potential. But we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Um, so I'm curious. I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of um, the market, right? Both on the the kind of Web3 and NFT side of things, uh, which obviously directly kind of impacts a project like this, right? Um, as far as just general adoption, general kind of... Um, audience that you're able to actually market to that wants to engage and has a digital like uh, wallet and knows how to buy nfts and all that kind of stuff how are you feeling kind of about the nft market in general and the evolution of it and kind of use cases like yours that want to see web3 being used for like really good impactful reasons kind of running up against the idea that on one hand, obviously the energies around like meme coins and basically gambling and all the speculation that everyone loves. Um, but even in even outside of that, there's just the general perception of NFTs and blockchain that is still unfortunately running up against a lot of FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt. Um, so how are you kind of feeling about the market and with a project like yours, how do you kind of keep your head down and keep building despite maybe some of the, the narrative out there? Yeah, wow, that's such a great question. 
Uh, so for me, because I'm driven by passion and I want to see this succeed, it's I'm thinking about the long term sustainability of it, of the project and just the potential that all this technology has to make a real world impact. And I'm not too concerned about the market. Uh, you know, markets come go up and down, um, but I try to like set that side of it apart and then just focus on the building, the world building and and making a real utility for these technologies. So, yeah, I'm thinking like with how the public sees it, it's understandable because any new emerging technology is going to have its quirks and its its downsides. And unfortunately, a lot of people will come in with the money and gamble and like push and like do all the hype and yeah. it'll, it'll give the space a bad name. But like, same thing with email. Like we get spam in our emails all the time. We have a spam filter for that. You know, it's like the underlying email protocol is still useful and it's not like we're just going to give up this technology. Right. It's here to stay. It's just, how do we start using it and filtering it in a way where it's actually beneficial and easy to use for the average consumer? Damn, that's a great breakdown. I haven't heard the email comparison yet, so that's a good one for <laughs> sure. <laughs> Makes sense, definitely. Um, yeah, that's amazing. And so when you kind of attend real world events, I know you're in Texas, so you were mentioning, you know, there's a lot of tech happening there. There's a lot of conversations around it. Um, you know, I'll be heading to NFT.NYC next week. Really excited about that. With a project like yours, you know, how important is it to kind of get in front of people in real life and have those kind of conversations? I believe you even traveled a little bit um, to explore the coral if I'm not mistaken, uh, and kind of see oceans and, and, and be more kind of uh, on the ground with it. So yeah, how important is it to kind of step outside of the digital space and really connect with people IRL and kind of advocate in that space as well? Oh, so important. Yeah, it's priceless even. I mean, the, the people that you meet along the way just serendipitously run into someone who may have an answer to that question that you have about tokenizing real world assets and things like this. And you know, there's like um, crowd stake, I believe I learned about just two days ago by going out to an AI conference, wow. you know, talking to some friends about how do we um, use these tokens to make real world impact. And that's one of the things is crowd stake. And I learned from a friend. So now I'm like connecting with the founder of that. And the idea behind that is you stake your ETH or whatever it is, and then the yield you can decide is going to be going to whatever nonprofit that you want to have like that impact for. So I was like, Oh, that's a, that's an innovative, good idea. So yeah, it's little things like that. It's like little by little finding the right people who can fill in the pieces of puzzle that you're missing to make this whole thing come together. And that's been the joy of this too, is, is, you know, you can be there stuck on the computer, figuring it all out. <laughs> but then when you go out, it's like such a different world because, you were figuring out all these answers that you need questions or the questions you need answers to. Yeah. And they're just right there. You just got to go out and find it. <laughs> that's true. It's true. The person next to you might just have all the answers you need. Um, yeah. yeah, no, that's amazing. Very cool. I, I wonder that's that brought up a lot of thinking when that crowd stake idea, <laughs> I never heard of that. Um, so I imagine in that scenario, you would be able to actually allocate, you know, a percentage that you want from your staking yield to go to a certain nonprofit. And I'm thinking, and when I look at a wallet like a, a Phantom wallet or some of these other new ones that really have a lot of these functionalities built right into the wallet, like even your staking, um, I would think that could become just like a new thing in Web3. Like how much of your staking do you want to send to X um, you know, advocacy group or nonprofit or whatever? And it's as simple as saying like 1%, 2% goes to this group um, and it could just all be done on chain. That's such a genius idea. And it doesn't even have to be specific to crowd stake. Like it could be just as easily integrated across pretty much any blockchain fairly simply. If we just cared yeah. a little bit, you just have to, you know, the developers and the innovators there have to take that on, I think. But it just got me thinking like wow that's such a no-brainer and such an easy thing because it's you're making the money on the on the return and obviously some people don't want to give any money and that's fine but just having the option to just click a couple buttons and take a small percentage of your yield and, and give it to charity that's genius it makes total sense I'm surprised it's not yeah. a more popular thing honestly well see that's that's our job is to change the culture right and mm -hmm. because it is like you know a lot of dgens a lot of gamblers um but you know, it doesn't make it fun unless you're actually doing something that's going to change the world, you know? So 
Let's go. Just being able to have that option is a game changer. It's a really, it shows that people are thinking about this technology in the right way. 100%. And it shows the power of the abundance. You know, we like to say we're yeah. switching from the scarcity mindset to the abundance mindset. And there really yeah. is no limits to what we can bring in and what can be created and what can, you know, the yield that can come from all kinds of different innovations and uh, creativity really on the blockchain that other people see value in. Um, how are you feeling about kind of the the hype train around NFTs and the idea that we need some form of quote unquote mass adoption um, to really kind of get to a place where the market is lucrative enough and where things are kind of growing the way they should be growing. Uh, hearing everything you just said about the utility and keeping your head down and really working for the sake of the innovation and seeing what's possible. How much do we need the market though? How much do we need kind of the buy-in from the population or are you just convinced in time they're going to get there and we're just in like 1992 internet or something, 94 internet or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm convinced we're going to get there. Yeah. Uh, you know, with um, applications like on the Bitcoin blockchain, like Noster, mm. and um, even we see like Warpcast or Farcaster, right. and these new like Web3 social media, where owning your data is the new paradigm. And there, we already see these things evolving. And it's just a matter of time till people realize this Web3 social media is so much better than web two and like people are burnt out with web two social media you oh my goodness tell. tell me about it man i yeah, feel like they're just destroying they're digging their own grave at this point like i had i had shut off the meta and went to twitter thinking you know at least twitter i can just whatever <laughs> hang out it's chill you know there's a lot of politics there's a lot of news but at least it's pretty chill and now it's just like oh yeah. my gosh man like what am i doing over here <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> it's like a culture yeah. war everywhere i look i can't can't escape the fire you know <laughs> It's, it's true. And a lot of the algorithm is controlled by that centralized entity. Mm. But, you know, with these Web3 social media emerging, these platforms are now going to give you more control over that algorithm and be able to decide, like, actually, I don't want to be dictated to. I want to, you know, have some say in what the algorithm showing me. And so I'm excited for that. And I think we're going to become our own market when you talk about do we need the market? Mm. I think it's a parallel economy, you know, and it's this digital realm where people are trading and these digital assets all the time. And now it just it gives people more agency over, you know, the attention economy. And um, yeah, it's also censorship resistant. So, you know, with all the, how the algorithm sort of like puts you in a silo or censor certain things, like, I don't know if you saw recently, there's a lot of posts going around on Instagram saying that there was a button where it's automatically limiting political content. And you have the option to do that? Now. That's hilarious. I would see Meta yeah. doing that. I could totally see Meta doing something like that. That's hilarious. Just because they like know when it comes to politics, year. people are just going crazy on their platform. So like, at least we'll yeah. give people the option to just opt out of politics altogether. <laughs> you know, That's hilarious. Well, they made that the default option. Oh, wow. That's the default. Oh, wow, of course. Well, yeah, I, don't know if I, I don't know if I agree with that, but as a political <laughs> junkie myself, I think it's good yeah. to be aware um, than not be aware at all. But anyways, exactly. to each their own, I guess. Uh, but Farcaster... I, I, I think I started it. I set up an account, but I have not tipped or used it really in any real way. Um, what are your thoughts on it? You, you like it and you think it's um, got some sticky appeal? It's going to be around for a while? Oh, yeah. Well, so the idea that you have an underlying protocol that many different applications can use is like, it's really cool because everything's connected, you know? So I think Twitter or, um, you know, Twitter has like the blue sky. And then Instagram has threads. So they're all trying to build like this Web3 technology for social media because they see it coming. Mm. So the writing's on the wall. But the Warpcaster app uses the Farcaster protocol, right? So okay. it's cool. They have like, you know, the DGEN token where you can tip people. If you see like a post that your friend made that you really like, yeah. you just tip them in DGEN. And then, you know, you're earning this currency for engaging with posts like you're actually earning you know engaged to earn i guess you call it no i do and they don't it. have that on traditional social media so. no they don't although one thing i do have to give credit to that was kind of the precursor to that and i think they actually pulled some of the team into farcaster was the brave browser the brave oh, browser nice. had really tried to like really went 
far beyond what everyone else was doing for creator economy kind of monetization, right? So you could use the Brave coin on your Brave browser app to essentially tip any creator who had another Brave browser. They had to have the Brave wallet, right? But they would know right from the browser whether the other creator had a browser. And if they do, you actually have the option to tip in Brave points or Brave coin right in your in your uh, browser. And that was across Twitter, YouTube, like pretty much everywhere. Um, a very cool concept. I think it didn't really get adopted unfortunately and the brave browser i had some issues with it when in my kind of peak nft collecting days <laughs> still collecting a lot of nfts but 2021 it got kind of silly um and the brave browser for whatever reason just crapped out and stopped supporting metamask and so i kind of put it to the oh. side <laughs> but i have to give them credit for that when it comes to monetizing and really using crypto to support and really tip creators they were doing that back in like, I think 2020 or even before then. So just kudos to the Brave team. Cause yeah, I think that's, it's a no brainer for a good use case for, for crypto, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Awesome. I know you mentioned that there is also a uh, augmented reality component to this. So we always like to look at the full gamut of XR, which is extended reality in the space. Um, and you were looking at how you're going to kind of use augmented reality for the coral verse. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Um, and then maybe how you see augmented reality more broadly, you know, being adopted? Yeah, absolutely. So with uh, Zora being a really nice marketplace, they have their own blockchain. I figured I would make a free to mint collectible of a starfish with a hidden message inside. So it's kind of a scavenger hunt, so to speak. But the idea is with on the mobile phone, you can go to the, the link of the, of the starfish, the coral verse starfish, and you can place it in augmented reality in your environment. And from there, you can sort of explore the ins and outs of this 3D asset. Um, and yeah, if you look inside of it, you might find a little surprise, but it's all about gamification and giving players a sense of ownership of the project. And that's really one of the fun things about it. Um, it was really cool. I'm yeah. looking at this uh, Coral vs. Starfish now. Um, it's looking like I could be the first one to mint it, and I might have to. Why? Because I'm very curious about kind of showcasing it as an AR use case at NFT yeah. NYC. Um, so oh, cool. with that, I could maybe show it off at the event. I'm just going to just thinking out loud here because I think um, it's an area that is not being emphasized enough uh, outside of some key people really working hard. You know, shout out to my friend Ebro, shout out to Hexidized, shout out to the whole over team over at the over the metaverse trying to like really push out an AR metaverse. That's kind of a Google Maps type of thing. And uh, we hope to have their team on the podcast, actually, hopefully in the oh, future. Cool. Um, but yeah, yeah I so guys. I love AR. I love the idea <laughs> of it. I love the use case it's just the most truly digital use case right where you're like yeah. literally pulling a digital asset into the real world using your phone to kind of blend the two things and i think the opportunities are endless from a marketing perspective from a gamifying perspective from a kind of uh treasure hunt per perspective right um that's one way you can gamify ar um but yeah just now I'm thinking about it and I, I want to show off what you got here. And I really love the 3D piece too. It's so well detailed. Like, was this an actual starfish or <laughs> it looks like it was yeah. an actual starfish. You just like took a very, very high res picture of and turned it into 3D. It's fascinating. Well, I, ultimately I want it to all be different species of coral. So a big part of the coral versus education, because hmm. if we don't learn about the value of the ocean and all these species, we're so disconnected of it, then we don't see any need to do anything about it. But when you go, come into the Coralverse, you're going to be presented with different experiences where along the way you're learning, oh, so this species of coral is actually like resistant to heat. And those are the ones that they're planting to repopulate. So, you know, learning about it and having a sense of ownership of that, like being able to collect these 3D artifacts from the Coralverse, have it in your wallet, have it as a list of your achievements. And the fact that they have real world value in terms of your contribution to ocean conservation is like such a fun idea. So 
Very just cool, so excited man. to be able to build this out, man. <laughs> I can imagine. And I'm happy for you. And that's why we love the show, because we get to talk to people that are genuinely just building because they believe in what they're doing. You know, it's not about yeah. shilling a coin or even shilling art or really just trying to make a buck. It's actually this is what we can do with this technology. This is what we're actively doing, working in the space. And yeah, it's really inspiring. It's really cool. And I don't think I actually have, I'm ashamed to admit, an NFT on Zora yet. Uh, I know there's a lot of really cool artists and musicians that have made some really uh uh, really cool pieces on on Zora. So, uh, but I I do need to get into the space a little bit. So maybe this will be my my introduction. Um, and well done, man. I just the lighting on it is Thank just you. really cool. <laughs> like I really love this piece. It's it's awesome, and I I'm very curious what it's going to look like in AR as well. So um, yeah, awesome. I love it. Yeah. I love that you have the the view and AR button on the Zora Marketplace, and that's why I chose the that platform. Yeah, because none of the other ones really had that. And I'm like, damn, that's really missing. No, that makes sense. And I saw some, I think it was Hexadize actually just post a video about it where he was showing off one of the his aura pieces that he had in an AR. And yeah, it looked really cool. So it definitely makes sense. And I can't, I don't know how hard that would be to kind of integrate that into your tech stack, but I don't think it's too difficult. Um, and maybe they'll be the first of many, you know, maybe other marketplaces will, will catch up and have that view an AR button, which is cool and definitely kind of gamifies your NFTs and you can show them off for people in a more kind of cool way and create some cool content about it. Um, yeah. so similar to the NFT question, I got to ask you about the metaverse as well, right? You know, we hear some people saying the metaverse is dead. We know uh, Zuckerberg decided to switch over to AI and drop his, uh, or at least, you know, pivot a little bit away from the metaverse, although I guess Horizon continues to evolve or whatever. Um, but, you know, over here, we're always looking at the Web3 metaverse and the metaverse that uses blockchain and cryptocurrency to reward the creators and really create an economic engine within the metaverse. Um, how are you feeling about the Web3 metaverse and its adoption and really just kind of the state of the economy and really even among those like us who love the tech, right? How are we feeling about it? Because I'm personally a little bit frustrated about a few different angles of it, most specifically the speculation and kind of the most promising projects also being the most overhyped and over-speculated and then ultimately rug-pulling some friends of mine, you know, who've spent way <laughs> too much money on these plots thinking they're going to the moon and, you know, they haven't yet kind of provided anything. So that's my frustration. Yeah. How are you feeling about the space? Yeah, I mean, that's such a good question. So when I was confronted with all these uh, different projects that are doing all the rug pulls and, you know, the idea of buying plots of land and then it's just empty land, nobody's using it. Like it's a lonely place right now in the metaverse, mm -hmm. but you have, that's why the gamification is so big. It's like you have to give a reason for people to go into the space and engage with the communities uh, living in the, in the metaverse. So um, you know, I wanted to create the coral verse in such a way where we've already built the world. We've already done the work uh, because a lot of the projects they'll say, okay, buy this token. And then we'll use that token to build this whole um, immersive world. Yeah. But I wanted to build it first and show that it's possible and then offer the token. Right. Yeah. I so it. that's the whole idea is like, you got to do the work up front. You got to make a real actual product that works. That's fun to use easy. And then, yeah, you want to buy into it. You want to use, use this technology. Here's the, here's the pathway to do that through this token, you know, rather than, rather than the verse, uh, yeah. because the reverse is like, it's, it's very speculative and that's where the pump and dubs happen. And that's what kind of gives people a bad feeling about it. Yeah, yeah. And I look at something like, I hate to pick on Sandbox, but I genuinely like what they were going for. And I just wonder why it's taken so long for them to kind of just be an open and like, uh, approachable world, I guess, because uh, I have a yeah. couple assets in the space. I don't own a plot or anything, although I've heard they're yeah. at least paying out their plot owners pretty well in the sand token, apparently. So that's cool. Okay. Um, and so there is a kind of yield that you're getting just from owning the plot. So Apparently, some of their owners are, are not worried right now about the state of the metaverse. But when I look at that metaverse, it seems like they've been very 
almost kind of closed guarded and like they've only allowed for certain events where you can go in and check it out um, and then if you're a builder and you own a plot then sure you can go work on your own plot but where's like the sandbox world that you can actually walk from one you know plot to the other and everything's interconnected and those people who spent 10 ETH or whatever on their plot besides Snoop Dogg can go walk over <laughs> and visit Snoop Dogg you know uh, what do you think about that like I just I, I have to I don't know I always ask people about sandbox because I just like it's just one of those it, there's others I could pick on, but Sandbox, I feel, is like the closest. Like, I've, I've been in there. I've run around when they had their, like, open beta, and it seemed fun to me. Like, I thought it was a smoother, a little bit more clean version of Decentraland, frankly, that also uses voxels. So it almost blended voxels and Decentraland in some ways. Um, so practically, I like it, but then it's just not the open metaverse that it kind of promised to be. <laughs> so how do, how do you feel about yeah. Sandbox specifically? I mean, I played around with the game and it was part of one of the first, one of the first alpha releases, but I think they're like on alpha four or something now. Okay. So I kind of like dropped off and didn't follow up with where they're at right now, but yeah, it's cool, man. I like it. It's, it's just like, you know, very expensive to own a plot and it's kind of like, I really want a spot next to Snoop Dogg, but <laughs> can I afford it? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, the land grab idea is interesting, but I chose to pivot away from that and being more like our plots in the Coralverse are not land, but it's like space and it, it, space is virtually infinite. So we, we can build as big a space as you want. And that's more of like the abundance mindset, whereas something like Sandbox is like scarcity. And so I think about the metaverse more of that abundance mindset, like we can build whatever we want. It's just what purpose is it serving, right? And if it's just for speculators to like, you know, buy up these scarce assets and then dump it on the community, <laughs> it's like, uh, I it could give a bad feeling. And that's why maybe like the mass meet mass, um, the masses, so to speak, uh, are a little bit scared of, of that. So yeah, yeah, I'm thinking like, it's better to go with the abundance mindset on the metaverse. That's cool. And I agree. Um, I, I know a lot of people in voxels who are kind of upset with them for doing exactly that because they bought it thinking there was a certain number of plots and then they went and added like 10,000 more or something like that. <laughs> and then they created those free spaces, which I, I agree, I'm with, I'm here for everything. Um, and I don't think it should be an issue where you're like trying to have like a very, very um, exclusive kind of experience and, and try to open it up as much as possible. Um, but when you look at the kind of size limitations, I imagine even in Monaverse and in the, the Coralverse, you would still have to place some type of limit um, just from a kind of size and feasibility perspective you know and, and when the people buy these plots these different architectural buildings i assume they are somewhat limited within the coral verse as to like how much space they can take up are they not so it's interesting you ask that so the space itself is so abundant and so vast it's more about like the textures that make the space look real like are those really high poly or like low pixelated. Mm. And so that's why uh, Minecraft went with the voxels because it's more like compressed, right? So you can have a, a more expansive world if the assets don't look good. So with Coralverse, we can make like a massive space mm. as long as like the textures and the poly count are all low. Um, but you could still have like a low file size but still have it like a massive space right. and high quality at the same time. So that's right. why I like building in Unity through Mona. Very cool, very cool. And have you done much um, building in other 3D software at all? Like do you do Blender? Do you do anything else much? Yeah, Blender and Unity are my go-to. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to get Blender down right now. I'm working on some wearables for nice. Decentraland, and it's been interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, it's it's my first crack at it. It's such but, a uh, hole. Got yeah, it. my friend it. has a lot more of experience in it than I do, so we're just uh, we're working it out. We'll see what happens. Um, very right. cool, man. So what are your thoughts on kind of like the meme coin activity um, and the concept that the excitement and I know we just talked about, you know, the gambling and all that. So it definitely lead kind of <laughs> related to that. But it does seem like the kind of degen excitement is more around the meme coins. And while there are some, you know, select NFT projects, usually more so in kind of the PFP space, right? And not as much in like the true art 
kind of I'm selling my art on the blockchain. Will you support me kind of thing? Um, how do you feel about kind of the meme coins kind of distracting from the art? And what can we do, those of us who want to kind of promote art on the blockchain and really help creators and promote the blockchain as a space for creators to go to, to create new revenue, create new opportunity, connect with new collectors and fans? Um, how do we push that forward? And what do you think about this kind of meme coin narrative being kind of the alpha of this bull run, if you were? Right. Yeah. Such a great question. So for me, I think like the meme coins are a really great way to, to create a culture where people are going to be passionate about engaging with those communities. Mm -hmm. So I love, I personally love it. Um, so the currency aspect of it is beneficial because that's where I think things start. You, you know, you want to have, um, a, a token or a coin that uh, has a lot of liquidity on a blockchain that maybe has lower transaction fees for, especially for gaming. Mm -hmm. Um, so like immutable X or like Arbitrum, uh, AVAX optimism, like there's a lot of gaming, uh, ecosystems emerging from those like layer two blockchains. And I'm actually surprised that there's not more meme coins on Arbitrum because they have, it's like the highest liquidity out of all the layer twos. And uh, yeah. so I would like to see more meme coins on there, but yeah, starting with the meme coins and then turning it into a game or NFT collection, like that's another way to do it. You yeah, know, where... I feel like those are the meme coins that are going to have real lasting power, right? Like I'm still waiting yeah. for some game to just like allow people to pay in Dogecoin or like right. earn Dogecoin for certain like missions yeah. and stuff. It's like, it's just a no brainer. Exactly. And I saw, I heard someone talking about making a Pepe game and they were going to be able to make, get yeah. Pepe coin from it. Like I'd be here for that. You know, I'd be playing that game yeah. all the time. Like, like Frogger. Uh, yeah. So from <laughs> a gaming Frogger perspective game. and a community building perspective, I'm totally with you. And I got some meme coins. Um, I'm definitely a fan of the the potential there, whether they get to that space where they actually become a little bit more used within a community and have, whether it's a gaming use case or even just a reward structure for the community um, remains to be seen for most of them. But I agree, it, it does offer that opportunity and it's a, it's a pretty cool option. Um, and so what I'm hearing basically is there doesn't necessarily have to be a, a contrast between the meme coins and the NFTs, but how do we kind of merge the energy if you you know as it were do you think that's possible yeah. and how how have you seen it done if, if you think it's being done already yeah well there are some cool protocols where you can embed um like erc20 tokens so like all the all the fungible coins mm -hmm. can be embedded inside of an nft like a piece of artwork and so by owning that collecting that piece of art you're sort of unlocking the currency which then you could use in different ways, like in a game. So I, I see it as more as like an interconnected web of like an ecosystem where all these technologies in the future, they're all work seamlessly together. Hmm. And it's just about the user. We need better like UI, user interface experience designers, but we'll get there. You know, they're starting to come to the space as they're needed and as the fundamental core technologies or all the bugs are worked out then it's just going to be a matter of time till the art side of thing. Cause as an artist, you know, you're touching almost every aspect of society Yeah, and that's what that's, you know, people want to have a good experience. They want it to be beautiful. And so, yeah, for me, it's like those things all interconnect and they're related to each other. And like the meme, the meme itself is art, you know, mm -hmm. but being able to collect, um, art with those meme coins i think is probably going to be the next step in the utility tokens yeah and i've seen that being done in some spaces uh, i know you mentioned yeah. arbitrum avax and optimism so it's definitely sounding like you're a pretty big ethereum guy those are layer two options are you looking at solana are you interested in kind of other blockchains outside of that ecosystem uh, a lot of these new meme coins to your point about the the fees right and the transaction fees a lot of the new meme coins are blowing up on solana because you can basically launch a coin for nothing and you can buy these coins and exchange them for next to nothing um are you open to that have you seen any kind of interesting developments in solana that's caught your attention uh not so much solana but uh there's a new blockchain that's emerging uh it's called Quai, q u a i hmm. and the idea behind that is they want to help redefine the trilemma the blockchain trilemma into a quatrilemma 
And so, like, they discovered... <laughs> is that a good thing, or does it sound problem. like a good thing? <laughs> yeah, I know. They're just adding more problems. But it's a braided blockchain, so they have, like, a, a different approach to... Because they're computer engineers out of UT Austin here. Hmm. And so the university is pumping out, like, brilliant minds. And the slogan at the University of Texas at Austin here is, like, what starts here changes the world. And I really believe that because I've been going to a lot of conferences there and like that's how did I got you, into blockchain. Did you attend blockchain. there as well? Or? I didn't graduate. I went to uh, Texas State University okay. in San Marcos. But Very cool. Yeah, I mean, it's cool to live next to the university here and be able to just go to these free events and, and learn about what's happening. But yeah, Kwai is something to look into because they are solving the trilemma. They, they claim to have solved the trilemma by adding a fourth problem and in a three-dimensional space so it's like the quatrilemma <laughs> i'm gonna have to dig into that that's sounding like yeah. quite a wormhole there jeff i don't know you're gonna send yeah. our listeners on a, a real uh, white paper research session q u a i yeah, right. quai that's the first i've heard of it so quai um, network you know, it's still good we're all learning here <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome so i'm here not really a huge fan of solana but open to other blockchains it's more centralized. You know? it is it is i know yeah. I, I'm hoping that like, cause you know, I think that when Ethereum started out, people could have said that was too centralized too, right? When you compare right. the Ethereum foundation to block to Bitcoin, it was, and the criticism was True. completely valid. Now, that being said, the Ethereum network didn't crash once, twice, or three or four times like Solana has, <laughs> unfortunately, but they say it's because they're, you know, going, they're trying to develop really fast and iterating really fast and they do have really high speeds. So, you know, if it breaks yeah. once or twice, they seem okay with it. Um, but I am hoping that they do something about that decentralization problem. And I have a good friend yeah. of mine, um, Grayson, who is in the kind of Solana dev sphere. And so he's privy to some of the conversations and they do seem to be concerned about the scalability within the current framework, right? And so they still uh, end up having essentially the same problem that Ethereum has, although no one can question that Ethereum has gone about it kind of the most decentralized way possible and that their fees, which are kind of exorbitant, especially now compared to Solana or Tezos or other options, um, they have a reason for existing ultimately. And they are making sure the you know network is not attacked. It's making the network a little bit more reliable into the long term, right? Yeah, and I, I believe in different chains for different things. <laughs> yeah. You know, like not, there's not gonna be a one chain to rule them all. I think it's gonna be an intra, you know, like kind of what Cosmos is doing I do like the Atom yeah. ecosystem. Yeah, I like Atom as well. I'm a big fan of cool. Cosmos, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I'm not sure how they're doing price action-wise, but I know they, they've got a good vision, and they do see that future of blockchains talking to each other and not picking favorites. And even Vitalik, to his credit, has spoken openly about that idea and not trying to make kind of Ethereum the kingmaker, king maker, um, but that yeah. you know, there should be a good competition of programmable blockchains, which is what sets apart kind of the Ethereum and the Solanas from a Bitcoin, although now Bitcoin's gone in their own uh, interesting degen direction where they're basically uh, trying to program it despite the fact it's not supposed to be. Uh, how do you feel oh, about yeah, Bitcoin right now and the ordinals? Are you, are you having fun with those two or what do you think about the innovations uh, happening over there? I did start looking into creating my own inscriptions. Um, you know, there may be some coral verse artifacts on the Bitcoin blockchain soon through some ordinals because they actually have the view and AR button in their market uh -huh. on the marketplace. There you so, go. So, love Smart that. Smart thinking. Was that on Magic Eden or on that other ordinal marketplace? I think it's ord, ord.io. Right, right. Ord, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Familiar. That's really cool. I didn't know they had AR as well. Let's go. Yeah. All the marketplaces should have an AR option. That's what I think. Uh, that's well, amazing. Yeah. So overall, um, how's the reception to the Coralverse? How are you feeling kind of about the way forward? It sounds like you were mentioning the gamifying. Obviously, you've got these NFTs that people can go and buy to support the Coralverse and to also join the actual 3D immersive environment and community in the metaverse. Uh, shout out to Monaverse. So it sounds like you've got a lot on the go, but like, what's the reception been like and how are you feeling kind of moving into the future? Yeah, so, so far the reception has been overwhelmingly positive. Like people love this idea and they want to see it happen. So we're offering artifacts that can be collected through the Artisan Fund, so artisan.fund. And they're a really cool project where they're using a, sort of a quadratic formula for voting on 
different match funds. So by purchasing an artifact, I think it's like 0.1 or 0.01. It's like super cheap, maybe $20, but you can buy as many artifacts as you want. And then that money goes directly to help the project evolve. So we're talking about gamifying the Coralverse. We already have a lot of the 3D worlds built, but next step is gamification and we need funding for that. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're just um, offering the ability for the community to help fund that directly through purchasing those artifacts. Yeah, and it is really cool that that came about um, initially as well with support from a grant, right? And the idea yeah. that that's what's needed in the space when, especially when it comes to like the bigger projects, right. And big initiatives, um, they do require some type of investment, obviously time investment, but in order to really help things grow in a speedy kind of innovative way, they need some funding. And so it's cool that you were able to get that. And now you've got a pretty interesting, uh, pitch and kind of, uh, angle for people to now help it go to that next level. So very, very cool and very Web3. And uh, we'll be happy to help push it out. And everyone should follow uh, Z Creative Media on Twitter, right? And uh, check out everything he's got going on over there. It's very exciting. Yes, thank you, David. Thank you so much. No, no problem. I appreciate it, man. Uh, is there anything else before we wrap up here? I know uh, we've hit the hour mark and uh, we've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. And I'm going to have to go read the Kwai white paper after this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but thanks for joining. Um, any final words before we wrap up? No, really just, you know, such a pleasure to have known you since the first days of the ecosystem emerging. And, uh, you know, so glad we finally got to do this podcast. Oh, I'm glad you were able to join, man. And uh, hopefully we'll meet in person sometime in Texas or at some other random Web3 event where we can uh, cross paths. But I'm uh, really grateful yeah. for this opportunity to speak with you. And we'd be happy to have you on in the future when your gamification is out there and rolling. And maybe you got more inhabitants of the coral verse and you're growing out. So <laughs> it's really exciting, man. Happy for you and uh, thanks for joining. And to everybody out there, uh, we'll be off next week because as I mentioned, I will be in NFT NYC, so I won't be having a live episode or any episode next week. Uh, but we appreciate all the listeners. Feel free to leave your comments in the comment section or reach out to us at web3warriors at gmail.com. And until next time, we'll catch you all in the metaverse or the choralverse. Take care. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs>